This is Michael Popak, Legal AF. The oral argument at the United States Supreme Court on immunity? Here's what's going to happen. They're going to find immunity for certain of Donald Trump's alleged actions in the indictment. They're going to find that immunity doesn't apply to certain of the actions that are in the indictment in the D.C. election interference case. And then as it relates to hybrid things, things that in performing his official conduct, then President Trump did things that stepped out of the line into personal affairs, they're going to find he doesn't have immunity for that either. But as a result, this case is going back to the D.C. Court of Appeals and or to Judge Chutkin for further proceedings to determine what is a private matter, what is a, uh, a official conduct matter, and what falls in between. I'm going to tell you why I believe that based on my analysis of having listened to the more than two-hour oral argument at the United States Supreme Court. I do it one place, right here on the Midas Touch Network and on this YouTube channel. And I don't blow smoke or sunshine. I'm doing it for legal AF. Let's start with what I believe is going to happen. Whenever I'm going to give you a decoder ring. I'm going to give you a way to decipher what right-wing Supreme Court justices mean. And when you hear one or more, or in this case, at least three Supreme Court justices on the right wing, tell advocates before them at the oral argument that they are going to ignore the facts of this particular case. They're going to ignore the allegations of the indictment. They don't care. They want to stay in the abstract of the hypothetical. Look out. Run for cover. That means they're going to completely ignore the record below. They're going to be unmoored unmoored from the factual record developed in the case before them which is the actual live case or con live case or controversy that they need in order to do their appellate review and they're just going to be making new law on a judicial activism type scale which is exactly what conservatives tell you they don't want to do so when you hear i don't care about these facts these facts are just getting us confused. I want to stay in the abstract and the hypothetical. Look out. They're going to be benefiting a party, in this case, the former president of the United States. We've got another thing going on here. Many of these Supreme Court justices, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, certainly Roberts, Alito, came up through the Department of Justice and the White House back in the 90s and 2000s when the neocons, the, the neoconservatives, and their approach to the presidency held sway. Their approach was called the Unitary Executive Branch, or um, uh, the, presidential, the Presidential Supremacy Approach, which means that they want, even though they're supposed to be co-equal branches of government and balanced power, they want a Leviathan. They want a supreme leader a unitary executive all housed with all the powers and with none of the limitations apparently uh, of a singular president and and all of these people alito kavanaugh gorsuch roberts all came up through that era and so their natural instincts is to side with the presidency and give it as much power as possible even more than makes anybody comfortable. Even if it means that giving some sort of immunity for a, a president sitting in the White House who orders the assassination of a political rival or orders a military coup or the like. And I'm going to break all that down. Let me tell you where I think this ends up. It's going to be five to four or six to three in favor of finding that for official acts, whatever that means, official core conduct of the presidency, there is absolute immunity for which there can be no criminal prosecution at any time. Doesn't mean there can't be an impeachment and a removal uh, at the Senate level for a conviction. At the Senate level, it means for criminal liability for things that sit squarely in core presidential functions, whatever that means, there's going to be absolute immunity. On the other end of the continuum or extreme, these five votes or six votes, depending upon Amy Coney Barrett, are going to find that things that are, are purely private um, behavior or conduct, not touching on or not part of official conduct, that can be criminally prosecuted even if the person once occupied the office and for which they'll enjoy no immunity. 
Then there's going to be that group in the middle. That's the part that matters, right? That's where the rubber meets the road, the gray area. Things that where he's doing or she's doing official conduct, but steps outside official conduct to do things in an, in an illicit or illegal way. And for that, they're going to find that there is limited or no immunity. Once they've established that, and I'll tell you who the five or six votes is going to be. Let's start from the most extreme and work our way in. Thomas and Alito. Thomas shouldn't even be there. He should have disqualified himself or accused himself because of his wife's involvement with, with the attempted overthrow of our democracy. But he did. He was there. In fact, just to prove he was there, he asked the first question during the oral argument. Alito and Thomas. Then we're going to move to Judge Chief Justice Roberts, Kavanaugh, and Gorsuch. Now we have our five. Amy Coney Barrett, and she'll end up siding with the five. That'll be six. And on the other side, in vigorous dissent to the position I just laid out to find that there is no absolute immunity, even for official conduct for a president, is Sotomayor Kagan and Ketanji Brown-Jackson. That's how it's going to shake out. I'd be shocked. I may be off by one vote, but that's going to be majority-minority decision-making here. What does it mean? It means that the case that we're supposed to be here on the actual case and controversy of Donald Trump versus the United States or U.S. versus Donald Trump is going to be sent down by the United States Supreme Court back to the District Court of Appeals, back down to Judge Chutkin for further proceedings to determine based on the indictment and the overt acts of the indictment, which fall into one of those three categories. Absolute immune official conduct, no immunity private conduct, hybrid conduct that may or may not depending upon the facts and circumstances achieve immunity that's going to have to happen first with motion practice and briefing practice and oral argument at the lower level and the loser is going to take another appeal what does that mean it means we're i'm wearing a giant watch we're out of time we're out of time to get this case tried before the november election there's just no way for all of what i've just described to happen at either level, even if the case is returned, let's say they return it, um, uh, there's a, an opinion of the Supreme Court, which is what it's called, and it comes on their last day before they all go for their uh, well-paid, uh, ex uh, really expensive holiday vacations, whether it's a yacht or it's spending the summer in Italy or whatever it's going to be, on both sides of the aisle, by the way. Uh, let's say they issue it in June. Judge Chutkin calls together a hearing of the lawyers in end of June, beginning of July. And she says, okay, I now have to do this process because I've been ordered to do it by my bosses of the United States Supreme Court. I want full briefing within the next two weeks. All right, now I'm in mid-July. Oral argument, end of July. She makes a ruling beginning of August. The loser takes an appeal. You see how long this is taking. It's taken four or five months to get to the Supreme Court. We're, we're, we've blown by November, and we've blown by this case getting tried before November. And if Donald Trump gets in office again, God help us, and he restores his presidency with this executive branch, unitary theory of, of supremacy with this Supreme Court, he'll dismiss the Department of Justice case, he'll dismiss the special counsel, or he'll try to, and he'll dismiss the counts against him. And this Supreme Court, or at least the five or six votes I just identified, will be okay with it. That is the nature of what they ruled upon. So when I heard um, Kavanaugh say he's not concerned with the facts of this case, Gorsuch say, I don't care about the facts of this case. I'm thinking about the future and our legacy. Alito say, I'm not concerned about the facts of the case. I want to make this abstract and hypothetical. I knew we were in trouble. Have you heard of cancer-fighting foods? The American Cancer Society discovered diets rich in fruits and veggies may actually lower your risk of cancer. Hopefully you hear this and run to the store for five servings of fruits and vegetables every day. If not, you should consider adding Field of Greens to your daily health regimen. Each fruit and veggie in Field of Greens was doctor selected for studied health benefits. There's a heart health group, lungs, kidneys, and metabolism groups, even healthy weight. 
What your body needs is at each scoop of delicious Field of Greens. Will Field of Greens prevent, treat, or cure cancer? Nope. But it's so powerful, it promises at your next checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. I'm pleased to report that I was able to get our listeners 15% off and free rush shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code LegalAF for your discount. That's promo code LegalAF at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. And then Roberts, who I held out some hope for, Roberts jumps in with, now you know who framed the issue on appeal. The sole issue on appeal. That was all that was supposed to be briefed and discussed was whether, and I'm going to paraphrase it here, a former president enjoys absolute immunity for official conduct. And I was sort of right in predicting what happened here. Most of what was written by the Court of Appeals below, the three-judge panel led by Judge Pan, Henderson, and Childs, it looks like the Supreme Court was okay with most of their analysis but didn't like the way they handled whether there was absolute immunity for official conduct. In fact, a slightly annoyed Judge Roberts said to the advocates, particularly the advocate for the Department of Justice, what did you make of of that point in the 60-page order below in which they said there is no absolute immunity for criminal conduct that could be prosecuted? And the advocate Mr. Dreben for the Department of Justice said, well, I just see that as a tautology, Your Honor. And Roberts jumped on that and said, right, isn't that the problem? I don't like that it's a tautology. I don't like that it's prosecutable because it's prosecutable. They got that wrong. We can't leave that that way, can we, sir? So Roberts obviously was the one that had written the, the, the question that was to be, that was to be answered on appeal and then drove the discussion related to that throughout the entire uh, debate over this. Uh, Very little talk until the very end about a former criminal president, Richard Nixon, although Ketanji Brown Jackson said, well, if presidents don't think they're going to be prosecuted and they've always enjoyed absolute immunity for anything they do in office, what was the Ford pardon of Nixon all about? What was that all about? Why did that have to happen if he didn't, if he had immunity? Now, Kavanaugh and others like Gorsuch jumped in with like, well, why don't pardons good? We should just pardon everybody. That was the best thing the country ever had when Ford pardoned Nixon, you know? And then Gorsuch, you know, uh, pontificating and, and gazing at his navel the whole time, talking about, well, couldn't Trump... Or, I'm sorry, I don't want to use real names. Couldn't that president just pardon himself? just do self-pardon the fact that he even raised the specter of self-pardon tells you where this again neo-conservative unitary executive branch analysis is being driven home by these five to six members of the united states supreme court Ketanji brown jackson stated it the right way when she said to the lawyer uh john sauer for donald trump why are we even debating and trying to put in buckets what is an a official conduct and what is a private conduct? Why does any of that matter? If the person commits a crime, right, a malum unse crime, a crime that we know when because we see it, it's obvious, it's a moral transgression, if you will, suffused within the criminal law. Even if the person occupies the presidency, because the person occupies the presidency, shouldn't they be criminally prosecuted? And, and what she had a very good way to put that in her debate, her cat and mouse debate with John Sauer, the lawyer for Donald Trump. She said, you seem to be worried about the fact that a possible criminal prosecution for a person sitting in the Oval Office with that title, uh, it, it may have a chilling effect on there being a robust presidency. I'm worried about the opposite, that there is no criminal prosecution for a person who commits crimes in the highest office of the land with all of the powers of the presidency left unchecked and therefore converting the White House into the seat of criminality. That concerns me. That world concerns me. And isn't that 
what you're creating. To which Justice Alito responded, turning everything upside down. Now we're in the upside down world. Wouldn't prosecuting a president destabilize democracy in some way, as opposed to wouldn't holding accountable one of the three co-equal co branches of government and demonstrating that no person is above the law, the law set by Congress, and as, ex as explained by the Supreme Court, doesn't that promote stability of democracy? But now that I've given you sort of the overview of the debate, proud of what Kagan, Ketanji Brown Jackson, and Sotomayor did, and what will ultimately be very vigorous to sense about how this new constitutional proclamation forevermore will destabilize our democracy, will invite worse criminality than even what we saw with Donald Trump, or maybe Donald Trump too, now no longer worried about criminal prosecution. We saw what Donald Trump did when he thought there was a there was a possibility of criminal prosecution. Could you imagine him back in office? I'm not making a dystopian view here. This is this is or apocalyptic view. Think about it. They make a ruling that anything within official conduct can't be prosecuted. What do you think Donald Trump does? If he ever gets back into power, he does worse, more cr criminality. A kleptocracy like we've never seen before. And that's what the left wing, or the thinking wing, I like to call it, of the Supreme Court, is worried about, as am I. Listen, dust, the briefing is done, the oral argument is done. I'm going to get on with Judge Ludig, friend of the pod, so to speak, over the weekend. He submitted an amicus brief along with others. He's got a strong opinion about the oral argument. He was embarrassed by it. He thought it was um, reverse engineering on display. They wanted to help this president out, this former president out, and make sure that this case doesn't go to trial before November, which is going to be the result. I'll talk to him more. I'll bring it to you in hot takes like this one. Special interviews for Legal AF. If you like what I'm doing on Legal AF, then you can leave me a comment and a thumbs up. It helps with the ratings and keeps us on the air. And then on Wednesdays and Saturdays, join me on Legal AF, the podcast at the intersection of law and politics. Join us. You'll find out why we call it Legal AF. And then pick us up on audio podcast platforms of your choice. If you like what I'm doing, go over to the Midas Touch YouTube channel. Look under contributors or playlists. Look for Michael Popak. You'll find my full body of work. I think it's 1,200 hot takes at this point. So until my next hot take, until my next Legal AF, this is Michael Popak. 